good, I guess, late morning to you all. My name is Dylan Horton. I'm the chair of the Davis Police Accountability Commission. Uh, I thank you. I. I, thank you. I'm really glad that y'all took a little bit of time out of your beautiful Saturday um, to come out for this event that we've been in one way or the other engaged in for the past year. Since uh, the murder of George Floyd last year, the whole world um, and our own community has been engaged in this effort to figure out what we can do locally uh, and I'm going to ask Reverend Malone to come to the stage uh, uh, in a second because he's our first speaker. Um, but we've been trying to figure out what we can do here in Davis to meaningfully change our system of policing. What we can do to get our public safety apparatus working to create public safety for all people in our community. What y'all know, because y'all are here at this event, is that our system of public safety, of policing, of prosecution, our court system is broadly inadequate to the task of providing public safety to everybody. It's you know, really adequate to the task of providing public safety to the wealthy and the well-connected. But when you are um, a person of color, when you are um, an immigrant to this country, when you come from a, a not the dominant uh, religious uh, background of this country, when you are a person undergoing a mental health crisis, uh, a drug or alcohol issue, um, if you are unhoused, if you just happen to be a white person having none of those uh, 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 demographic backgrounds, but just in the wrong place at the wrong time, your public safety, your security and prosperity in this community can be harshly impacted, again, by this system so broadly inadequate to the task of providing public safety to all residents. So we're here today, again, in the continuation of a movement and an engagement that we've been in for the past year to demand that our city put their money where their mouth is. On June 22nd, or thereabouts, give or take a, a day or two, the Davis City Council will pass its uh, budget for the next uh, budget cycle. Um, what we have heard um, in a number of engagements at the December uh, City Council meeting when we presented the recommendations um, at their April 6th City Council meeting is verbal commitment, uh, light, I should say, verbal commitment to supporting the nine recommendations that the Police Accountability Commission, Human Relations Commission, and Social Services Commission brought them in December. But what we fail to see in this year-long process, despite a number of opportunities, is that that ink get dried on the paper, is that uh, support for these reforms brought into the tangible realm where we can see and be confident that it is real. So high school, I went to the high, there were parties, I didn't go. Because I, I wanted to eliminate any chance, any kind of, kind of uh, interaction I could have with the police, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So the reason why I'm telling you all this is because, fast forward, I'm now 24, out of college. I've done many things, you know, folks kind of knew me from, if you went to UC Davis from 04 to 08, I played in the men's soccer, I was a captain. We went to NCAA, we did many things. So I was known as the big man on campus, as a student athlete, right? So I kind of, I was well known in town as a student athlete. Again, I need to smoke, still don't drink. But I enjoy dancing, I'm a very fun guy. So I'll go out, you know, <laughs> to the clubs in downtown. Thank God for the entertainment. Davis could be very boring. <laughs> So on one particular night, you all know about Camry. Camry was shut down before the unfortunate incident. I, I also encountered something that I, I couldn't believe. But in retrospect, it makes sense now. The reason why I'm telling you all this is because of the intersection between a systematic oppression, broken system, and the people that are well, that are well aware, aware of it, and they're willing to milk the system. So in this case, it's the business owner and the police PD. And I happen to be, you know, the victim. So 
the owner, who I'm not sure why, I'm not gonna get into, didn't like me for some reason. I'm inside the club, you know, with my friends. Again, I don't drink, I don't smoke. Usually when there's any altercation, guess who's breaking it up? Sule, because I'm usually the only super one in the club. Like, guys, come on, stop. So I know my, I'm really, I take pride in the mediator. I love being a mediator. That's, that's my role in life, which is one of the reasons why I went to mental health and being a counselor. So I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, there were four cops that showed up, like flashlight. This is like 1.30 in the morning. And be like, whoa, whoa what's wrong? Hey, who's Sule? Who's Sule? I'm thinking, what? What did I do? Like, oh, shit. Like my whole 14 years in Davis, I spent literally working on being perfect. Like, didn't, doing my best, not breaking the laws. Why did, why did the police want me? Not one, but four police inside a club. So I sat there. I didn't move. They were like, you got to get out. I said, excuse you? I said, no, you got to get out. I'm not moving. I didn't do anything wrong. I came in here. I've been dancing. I'm sitting down. So after about 30 minutes, now my friends, they're getting mad at me because I'm messing up their buzz, I'm messing up their fun. They're like, Sule, come on, you gotta get out, man, you know? So I walked out. One of the cops was a black man. I, I was furious, I was like, wait, why did y'all just little four people to come kick me out and I knew I didn't do anything wrong? Meanwhile, everybody was thinking, why, what did he do? Did he do something, did he you know, hurt somebody? So now my reputation that I worked on for 14 years, it's now being you know, tainted. So I went out. I said, so I, the cop called me over, the black one. He said, hey, come over here. I said, what happened? What's going on? He goes, well, the owner told us that um, you were selling drugs inside, inside his club. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, he, he told us. I said, so you didn't ask him? He's like, my bad, man. We just do what we were told. So literally, his excuse was, they, were, they, they got a call that a black man was inside the club selling drugs. And they ran over there and they kicked me out. So why am I telling this story? So let's assume that, you know, for some reason, I didn't work so hard on being almost perfect, right? Maybe that night I was just, you know, I had a bad day, right? Maybe that night I had a little, you know, I was a little buzz. I'm just tired of the systemic oppression. I'm just sick of, you know, being picked on, being treated like, you know, the second season, right? And the cop said, get out, and I stood there and I didn't move. That's how someone ends up getting killed. Hello, I'm really glad to see you all out. Change doesn't come without individuals willing to put themselves on the line and willing to get out there and do the work. And doing a rally like this is doing the work. The march will be seen by a lot of people. Uh, to introduce myself again, I'm Cynthia Rodriguez and I'm running for the Yolo County District Attorney's Office. And thank you. We have a tough fight ahead of us, but I think a lot of people have seen that we have not been getting the service out of our uh, District Attorney's Office that we deserve. Uh, I, uh, those who know me know that I spent almost a decade as the um, general counsel for the State Department of Mental Health, advising the governor's office, the legislature, and um, all for all the mental health care that was given in the state. And it, mental health care used to have its own department. When I started there, it had a department of mental health uh, with people specifically interested in that to deal with the problems of people who have mental health. Now it has been combined, most uh, Medicare issues have been sent to Health and Human Services, mental health only runs the state hospitals, and the state hospitals are far over 95% patients from the corrections. And that is because there is no system that we use on a regular basis except the criminal justice system to deal with people who have mental health crises that are become public. And that is just the opposite of what ought to be happening. Mental health care crises are <laughs> intimate and private and ought to be cared for in the community every chance possible. The community resources that we need to, to be out there, to be amongst the public, to have counselors and responses and places for safety, those are now being once again diverted into the old systems that never worked. Black lives matter! 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 Black lives matter!
I mean, I, I think you just, after an introduction like that, you have to acknowledge that you left, I left a lot of things undone. Um, and I, I don't live all my life with regret, but there are things that I could have done, pushed further on that I just maybe lacked the courage to do. Um, and that's why I'm encouraged to seeing you all here, because I think this, I didn't see this uh, five years ago. And so it does my heart good to see people coming out and really not just doing this but actually doing the significant behind the scenes work and so i appreciate everybody being here and and trying to figure out ways to actually make this happen okay so i, I just wanted to quickly remind everybody um you know you've heard about the process with the temporary joint subcommittee and the report that took so so long and with so much care from so many unpaid commissioners in this city who spent their time and effort really putting together this amazing document um, and then it was presented to City Council in December. And we were really hopeful that we would be heard, right? Um, this wasn't something pithy. This was like 80 pages of really academic research um, with an eye towards what does Davis need specifically. Um, and we waited from December to April to hear what uh, city staff would do with that report, what they would do with those nine recommendations. And to remind everybody, in April, they came back, they being city staff, came back with a report that was written by the chief of police, primarily. He's the first author, he just named right on that document. And they said, well, we see your nine recommendations and we offer you a list of what we are already doing um, and a list of some things that maybe wouldn't be too uh, crazy. So we're gonna do those. Um, and that's actually what we're even grading city council on on this flyer, is this watered down document that does not address all of what we asked them to address. And, and even those uh, watered down recommendations, by our account, um, they are getting around a D plus average from those nine recommendations. Um, so they really are not addressing the problems. They are not thinking, um, as Rob Davis said, in a transformative way about you know, using leadership to transform the narrative, to go beyond what Chief Pytel is saying at any given second to what city staff wants us to believe is possible with the budget. Um, they're not doing that. And they have a lot of nice words for them. I, I gotta say, you know, I listened to that April 6th council meeting and if you had asked me right after Mayor Partita had spoken and given her speech, I would have said, this is in the bag. They are gonna make a new department. If you'd asked me after Will Arnold spoke that night, I would have said, yes, that's two council members for a new department. And then when the Lucas spoke, I would have said, yes, that counts as well. But none of them decided to take a vote to take any action all they did was say, I see what the police chief has written, and I like that, and we're going to vote on that. 